Hey guys, this is Josh. Exciting episode today. We're talking about Gnosticism and their view of the material world. But before we get into that today, we're going to go get some breakfast. We're going to go watch Star Wars and we're going to go on a date because it's our anniversary. So see you in a sec. We're leaving over easy, the breakfast place. Josie, what were your thoughts? It was okay, everybody. You heard it here first. We watched Star Wars. How was it? So, you were like, what the heck is his eyeball doing? Okay, so in our last video, we dialogued about the creation narrative. And in the, the gospel, in the Christian faith, we seek the creation narrative of Genesis 6 as the beginning of the story. Uh, because our God is uncreated. He is the only supreme being of the universe. However, in the Gnostic myth, uh, the story of Sabaoth, the God of the Old Testament, he's fallen, he's evil, he's wicked, and he was created. Therefore, there must be a prior story. So in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Nag Hammadi texts. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the secret book of John and the Gnostic gospel of Judas. And we're going to look at those texts, kind of compare them with some of the writings of Irenaeus to kind of explain to you uh, what happens in the Gnostic myth. As we piece these texts together, the unknown spirit is the God of Gnosticism. He seems to be like a singularity or a brain, if you think about it. And as he evolves and conceptualizes certain thoughts, uh, whether it be self-awareness, whether it be wisdom, these thoughts actually embody uh, deity. They become persons. One of these beings is created is wisdom. Wisdom has offspring. Uh, these other gods like self-awareness have offspring, so forth and so on. They, they have gods who have gods who have gods. The terms of eons and demogorgons and some of this stuff just gets absolutely ridiculous and we don't have time to get into that in this video. That being said, uh, as we look at uh, this story, what, what's the most important today is that we look at wisdom. Uh, Mother Wisdom actually created a being called Sabaoth, but she created this being without consulting the singularity, without consulting the unknown spirit. And because of that, Sabaoth was twisted, distorted, and broken. Sabaoth created the earth. And when he created the earth, uh, uh, Mother Wisdom was, she was afraid uh, of the kind of his destructive power and his destructive nature. So she decided to trick him. Her and some of the other deities gathered together and convinced him to create mankind. Now what he does is he breathes his breath into mankind, but in doing so actually loses his divine nature. But what's important here is that by giving him, them this spirit, uh, they become living beings, but they don't become incarnate. They don't become in flesh. Right. So uh, what he has to do to trick them, because they are completely aware of their divinity, they're completely aware of their own their own divine nature. He actually has to reform them into physical flesh. So that's why uh, the Gnostics will look at the book of Genesis and say that there's two creation narratives that created everyone, male and female. And then in the second account, he sees them forming them out of the dirt. Why does Yabaoth do this according to the Gnostic myth? Well, he wants to be worshipped by all of creation. And creation's not going to worship him if they know that they're actually greater than him. And what happens in the serpent narrative that we discussed last week is a serpent is coming in to try to reveal to them through the knowledge of good and evil that they're actually better than Yabaoth. Now, this is obviously bad for a couple of reasons. First of all, it completely deteriorates uh, the integrity of the book of Genesis and rewrites all of its characters. But furthermore, as far as this is different from the Christian faith, there are some serious problems here. A uh, first being that carnation or or flesh is actually evil, wicked, and sinful. Uh, uh, you look at Christ, for example. When Christ came, he was perfectly holy and sinless and spotless. Look at Adam and Eve before the fall. They were completely holy and sinless and spotless. Look at the new Jerusalem. One day when we are glorified in our glorified bodies, 
what's going to happen in the new Jerusalem when we're glorified? Well, we're going to be completely sinless, holy, and spotless. So when we look at the gospel in comparison to Gnosticism, Gnosticism teaches that all things that are incarnate, that are made in flesh, are inherently evil, wicked, and sinful. Yet the gospel tells us that there are preconditions which which would allow humanity to live in holiness, right? We do teach and believe in original sin and the nature of and the fall of Adam that was passed down through Adam to his descendants and from his descendants, so forth and so on. So we do believe we were born with a sinful nature. We don't believe that the flesh itself is inherently sinful. We believe that the flesh can be glorified. Uh, we, we believe that, that, that Christ has been uh, embodied uh, fully God and fully man in an incarnation. Okay, as I'm editing this video in my pajamas, I realized that I lost a specific portion of this interview uh, in the audio. The audio just was completely corrupt, so I had to reshoot this. That's okay. Here it goes. What one of the doctrines that many Gnostics believed was that of docetism. Now, as we've already explained, the material world, and especially the physical flesh, is evil and corrupt. Therefore, uh, the Gnostics or many of the Gnostics would teach that Jesus never actually came incarnate. He never actually came in the body. Some would say that he like possessed a person. Other would say uh, that he was kind of a, a projection or uh, an illusion, a spiritual kind of representation of who God was, but never actually physically coming incarnate in the flesh. Some teach that Jesus came fully as a man, empowered by the Spirit, having absolutely no divinity. Others would say that Jesus came fully as God and not really having flesh like we do, uh, completely God and not human at all. However, that's a, that's a heresy. That's Both of those are false doctrines. Uh, the Bible teaches that Jesus was fully God and fully man, uh, able to rightly represent us. That's enough. Back to the video. Now, this is more than just uh, splitting hairs. This is an essential Christian doctrine. If we begin to teach that Jesus did everything as a man, then he could not die on the cross for us and forgive us of our sins. If we teach that Jesus was only fully God, like the Gnostics teach, then he is not a man who is rightly able to represent us before God's throne or rightly to be our substitute. So in the gospel, the Christian gospel, Christ must be fully God and fully man so that he is able to forgive us of our sins and also be our proper representative. Next week's episode, we're going to be talking about how the Gnostics viewed the spiritual world, how they believed that the, the carnal earthly world was evil and how the spiritual world was the only one that mattered. So stay tuned for that. As we hope you've enjoyed this video. If you like this video and would like to see more videos on Gnosticism, give us a like, give us a subscribe, Make sure to comment down in the comment sections and we would love to see more videos on Gnosticism. We hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, for more content like this, you can go over to our website at theremnantradio.com. See you next time.